Funding for Current Conversations is provided by University of Oklahoma President's Office, University of Oklahoma Outreach, and World Literature Today. Welcome to Current Conversations. I'm R.C. Davis Indiano. Today we have a very special guest, Sister Rosemary Nyarumbe, a Catholic nun who, in 2014, Time Magazine designated as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. She is the founder and director of St. Monica's Vocational School in Gulu, Uganda, and in 2001, she began working with young girls who had been abducted, raped, and pressed into military service, often being forced to kill their own families. Her story is going to inspire you. Join us. Could you take us back to um, South Sudan and Northern Uganda in the early 2000s? There was a human tragedy unfolding there. Could you briefly tell us what that was? What was happening back then? It was a very difficult situation and uh, it all started in Northern Uganda and it moved to South Sudan. South Sudan became like the base or hideout for rebels. And also it was a place where they would take people or children they were abducting. But the whole thing started in northern Uganda. That was a very difficult time when everybody was living in fear because of the Lord's Resistance Army trying to destroy villages, capturing people, abducting women and children and taking them to captivity. And especially young children up to age five mm. were able to be abducted. Then it was another difficult moment because parents found themselves quite helpless and you would find every night they would send their children away to go and look for safe places where they could sleep, like in towns or in schools or hospitals. You would see so many children walking right from 5 p.m. to go to hide. And the uh, international community came to know those children as invisible children, mm -hmm. but were calling them really night commuters because these are children who are traveling every night to go to look for where to sleep. And in St. Monica, the school where I'm working, we used to have 500 children every day hiding. And of course, it was very difficult for us to know where to hide them and also just to feel that they may not be safe. Luckily enough, we had so many containers which were used in the past for construction and transport, uh, transporting things. Those containers were for us used for hiding children instead. So we were keeping them there. But at the same time, some of these children were abducted while they were traveling to come and look for these safe places. And the rebels would take them to captivity, train them as child soldiers, and uh, the situation for girls became doubly worse because they were even used as sex slaves. And a lot of these children were made to kill their own friends. Some were brought back to kill people in their own villages or towns. And that was the most difficult situation and scary that even adults were not able to stay in their homes. In fact, a lot of people were all collected living in the most dehumanized situation in the places called uh, camps, which were formed like by government soldiers, thinking they would protect the people by letting people live in camps, but in fact they were more exposed to the rebels. I, I want to thank you. I want to go back to the point where you entered the picture, and let me make sure I, I have this straight. This was a time of insurgency. Yes. And there was the Lord's Resistance Army, headed up by Joseph Kony, and he was, I think you said, particularly uh, abducting girls and then pressing them into military yeah. service. And the point where you come into the picture is where when all of that's sort of over, those girls need some place to go. In fact, I came in when it was not even over. I just noticed there was a very difficult situation and I, I could see there were some girls who were around coming back trying to escape. And in fact, when I went to Gulu, I had not known even that situation was existing in the most difficult way in that. So I looked at the situation and I kind of read the signs of time. And I thought, 
that was the only moment we could just open our door, could let the school not just be treated as a school, but become more of a home to welcome these young women who had nowhere to go because as they escaped to come back, their people, the society was afraid of them. And everybody knew that these were potential killers, these were murderers, and they were calling them by names. And their own relatives, even their own parents were afraid of them and said, we could not live with these people in one place because they were trained to kill. So I decided that San Monica would become a place to welcome these girls and make them feel more at home. It was really out of compassion and so, yeah. so you were focusing on a need, my guess is, that not a lot of other people looked at because here were these girls that were forced into committing these crimes against humanity, killing their own families. So basically, they're pariahs. I mean, nobody wants to have anything to do with them except that you noticed that they were uh, stranded. Yeah, they they and needed some place to go. Sure, and it was so difficult to imagine people thinking to say that, we can do this to help this group of people or these children. And definitely, I personally never thought whatever I was doing would be something big to help and bring awareness. I really started it like in a small way, just moved by this situation and seeing exactly that I would have been in the same situation because I come from northern Uganda. I am a woman and I was born in that situation. I know the culture and I knew these children were totally abandoned, were not accepted. I said, since I feel I am, I've been quite lucky, I've never been abducted, I managed to grow in my own homes, and I managed also to be able to go to school. My parents looked after me, and I thought I would do something different to change this situation. There, there must have been people who disagreed with you. There must have been people at the time who said, look, these young girls acted like adults, they committed atrocities, they chopped up family members, killed whole f their own families, etc. And so you had to swim against the tide and basically decide to be their champion. I'm sure there were people who disagreed with you. In fact, there were a lot of people who disagreed with me. And of course, one thing is that St. Monica is a Catholic school to start with. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be able to welcome girls who are expecting, who are pregnant, girls who have very difficult background, especially being murderers, and girls who had children. That was totally against mm -hmm. any policy of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thank God because I didn't ask anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I just went on and started it. Of course, I met a lot of criticisms, and I had the most difficult time of my life. And uh, I had some priests who even confronted me. And one time I told one priest, I told him, I said, Father, you keep on praying, and we meet in church. I will continue doing what I'm doing. Because I think it is very important to help these women, these young girls and their children, because they were wondering how I was inviting women to come to school with their children. I, and of course, I didn't have a place where to keep the children as well. I can see that St. Monica's, uh, well, what we call now St. Monica's Vocational School, it was really just a, a kind of safe haven for a while. Was there an experience, a single experience, that showed you the possibility of a vocational school, something that could serve the girls more directly? You know, that was something which just came as a need because you can see these girls were abducted from very early stage of education. They didn't go far with their studies. And of course, you wouldn't know what to teach them if you really thought you were bringing them to school. Yeah. And I, I totally felt helpless because I knew there was no way I could teach them anything. And even if I speak about vocational training, I started with the helping them to learn how to make dresses, and I'm not a seamstress. Mm -hmm. I started teaching them how to cook. I've never gone to culinary school. <laughs> I have started making them learn how to do other courses which can earn them a living. I did, I did none of those. What I can say about myself is that I came from a background of vocational skills because I've always seen my parents, I saw my father. My father was the best carpenter in town. Mm -hmm. And I saw with this carpentry, he brought us up, we all went to school, and of course, I thought that was something which was quite practical. I don't know if my father went to school, but I never saw him going to school, but I saw him doing the best work. So I knew these are some of the things I would introduce to help this young people. As I recall, you had sort of two areas of teaching. There was the practical life skills, and then there was the vocational 
learning how to do a job. Yes. How did you develop that curriculum? It then? was all looking at the situation and finding out some of these young women who are not capable to cope with any life situation. And when I went, I didn't even know that some of the girls I had were in captivity. They were rebels. And I noticed one girl was actually one of the rebel leaders. She went so high to a rank of a commanding officer. And uh, what I noticed, she was not able to cope in any class, either with academics or even with the practicals. And she was not able even to interact with others, not even with me. Mm -hmm. She couldn't look at anybody in the face. That is the girl who gave me all the inspiration to think and ask her if I could introduce practical skills, if she could cope with. And I had to dig into the reasons why she was in that way. Okay. And she told me about you, her So life. You're, you're really taking what was a sanctuary and it's becoming a school of practical and vocational uh, training. You have no budget because nobody's given you any, no, no, any no, money. No. The church is not particularly no. for this. How did you, if you don't mind my asking, how did you find the courage in yourself to, to begin this? I mean, it was like climbing a, a very steep mountain. You know, what remained on my mind always was the ethics of work. I knew with my hands, with my brain, with all the intellects God gave me, I could do something. And that's all what I am up to today. And I told these girls, we are not going to sit and wait for money. When I started teaching them catering, it was not catering, it was basic cookery. And I told them, I will be with you. I know how to cook because back home, I learned how to cook from my parents and I can teach you how to cook. But we're not only going to cook and give people, we're going to ask people to come and eat the food and pay money for it. And I did it technically because I wanted people to see that these people are now human beings and they have dignity. They are cooking well. They're going to minister to people by giving them food because I knew this is something which will last for them. Cooking and starting that kind of business would be something which will last forever. It's hard for me or probably anyone hearing this story to imagine the kind of uh, uh, pain these girls must have been dealing with. How did you even begin to approach some kind of healing? You know, they had done things that, that people don't even like to hear about, and they had actually committed these You know, one, one thing about it all was just to totally ignore their background. Stay with them as if you knew nothing, not even showing any fear. And I felt that these girls needed more of motherhood, of love and acceptance. And that's all what I offered them. And of course, that fear was for me, not only the fear that they would turn against me or kill anybody with who we're living. My fear was, how are we going to help them to get out of this? But I told them every time, as you're here, you must contribute to your own rehabilitation. You must work towards this. We have to work together. And so what I found was very important was being present in all the situation. Now, I don't mean this to be an impertinent question, but I mean, were you never fearful that you could be hurt? I mean, these were people that uh, they killed a lot of people themselves. You know, one thing that I never, ever feared that these girls would okay. hurt me because we developed a certain friendship to the level that they were trusting me more. Mm -hmm. They were listening or I was giving them time. And honestly, I was never asking about their background. By listening to them and giving them a lot of time and caring for them, they started opening up by themselves to tell me exactly their own background. Now, now did most of the girls have children? Uh, majority. Ma majority of them. Majority had children. So the community in Uganda was resistant possibly to the girls and to their children, Yes, right? and of course, the situation was even more complex with the girls who had children from the rebel leader himself. Because these girls, first of all, they were scared even to leave their children behind, knowing that people would take revenge on these children. And of course, speaking with some of them, they were able to express to me that they have had people speaking that their children are flourishing, they are growing, and yet theirs who have been killed by their father. And uh, that even gave me a confirmation that I really needed to create a possibility of mother and child education. I would never separate them. They must come together because all of them needed care and love. 
And of course, the children, even of the rebel leader, I always looked at them as innocent children who really needed love and care and acceptance. I mm -hmm. never saw any difference in them. Uh, what did you do for money? <laughs> uh, I mean, there's a lot of people. I think that at some points there were maybe 250 girls in the school yeah. and 250 mm -hmm. children, 500 people. That's a lot of mouths to feed, a lot of uh, bodies to give beds and so on and so forth. What did you do for money? We suffered a lot. We had no money. And of course, we went a lot of times without food. Many times we ate very little. and. You can't imagine, if I think of how much we were eating with all the children, it was more painful for me to see some of the children sometimes coming to sleep there without food, and it was really painful to see. So I made myself into begging and asking anyone I could ask. And one of the groups I remember, I asked for food for the children of who were sleeping there, the night commuters. I went to Rome and asked Saint Egidio, because I heard that they were helping people, poor people and so forth, and I really begged them, I said, if you can help me to give only one meal to these children, mm -hmm. I would be happy. And they started doing that. And of course, one thing still remained, I always said to the girls, we have to work hard. Mm -hmm. We must not wait for money. And so our working hard paid off. When I taught them how to cook, we of course invited people to come starting to eat in our school. And definitely the first time I got so many people who came there for a workshop of two weeks. Mm -hmm. I got scared because we didn't have all the things we had to use to serve people. And I went to shops and begged for things. I asked them, if you give me, I'm sure to pay you back in two weeks. I was not sure about that, but <laughs> I was ready to stand for it. And, and did, I got everything. Didn't you also get calls with people wanting to bring their children yes. from the community and yeah. use it as a kind of daycare? Yes, people were calling and of course they were still telling me, Sister, you have very good facilities, we would like to bring our children, but we are only worried and scared that you have so many children from captivity, the children of the rebels. And, and I told them, if you want to bring your children, I have no problem. I don't have children of the rebels. I don't have rebels, I have innocent children. Now, uh, St. Monica's has a tie to Oklahoma now, right? Yeah. Could you talk about that a little bit? Is that uh, pros for Africa? I mean, that is a special tie, and it really came at the most difficult time, at the most needed time, at the time when we needed people who can come up and know us. And it all started with one man, Reggie Wheaton, mm -hmm. who actually went through a difficult situation after the loss of his son, and mm -hmm. he was only taken to Africa which was not exactly where he wanted to be, where he thought he would go himself. And uh, he was taken to see me, and uh, luckily enough, his friend had known me. And uh, when they met the situation we were dealing with, Reggie came back and uh, he always said that was for him like medicine, and he knew the suffering of the children, of the girls he saw, was more than his own suffering. Mm. And he decided that he would not sympathize with himself, but he would do everything to support us and help us. That's how eventually he grew on and on to start Pros for Africa, bringing in a lot of people from Oklahoma, and it all started here. And that's how I also became exposed to Oklahoma. I became an Oki for that. And so, well, we're, I'm glad to have you as an Oki. It's wonderful <laughs> to have you here. Thank so you. if somebody wanted to get involved and wanted to support what you're doing, they could Google Pros for Africa. They could go to Pros for Africa, but Pros for Africa also has gone up to creating Sewing Hope. And Sewing Hope actually can tell a lot of stories of what we are doing. And also there is the book on Sewing Hope. Mm -hmm. The book is titled Sewing Hope, and then there is also a movie on Netflix, Sewing Hope. I've seen I, it. It is a beautiful documentary. A documentary. I encourage people to read the book and also watch the movie. Because for me, the book really tells the story of our time, and also it will help us to really know that we must work hard to stop evil. We must make sure that this type of evil has to stop. It, what, can you give us a, just a brief report on Uganda? Has the, the, the insurgency calmed down? Is it, is it relatively peaceful now? I mean, what's the situation? Well, the insurgency calmed down in 2006. That means the active abduction of people stopped in 2006. But the rebels moved, they were flushed out from Uganda to South Sudan, and from, from South Sudan they moved to Congo and Central Africa. So that means actually it didn't stop. 
And one thing which I always tell people, we may think the insurgency has stopped and we may also think it may be pointless to do, for instance, the work I'm doing. I think that's not something we need to discuss in that way because this situation affected people for more than 20 years. Mm -hmm. And of course, the people who suffered are still feeling that pain. For me, this is the time to start rebuilding these people. Mm -hmm. This is the time to start sowing hope, mm -hmm. mending these broken lives. And that's why I always emphasize the fact of using needles, using our hands, using our trash, put them together, and the trash is all coming well, from here. This is one of the, the purses, right, that's yes. created at yes. St. Monica's. Yes. And uh, they're sold all over the world now, right? Yes, this is still something we you can look at, but it, it signifies the brokenness of these people, especially young women who are creating this, and the children. You can see those beautiful faces and smiling faces. They would have never smiled without that effort of giving them hope. Mm -hmm. And of course, I always tell people, we have to move from trash to treasure because these pop tabs are considered as trash, but to someone else, they are, they are totally a it's treasure. It's made from pop, the pop tops exactly. of uh, soda cans. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And of course, it's beautiful. My, it looks like trash, but then it really brings hope and dignity. It's, it's beautiful. So are the, the, the young women in the school and their children, um, are, have, have things succeeded? Are they being reintegrated back yes. into the community? Yes, that is one story I can always say. It's a great story of hope. Mm -hmm. Because these young women would never have been integrated. They would have never been hopeful. But they are hopeful because they are taught how to work. They are taught how to earn for themselves. They have gone out of the idea that they would be living like uh, begging or going for odd jobs or prostitution. How long are the girls generally at the school before they're able to move on? And then where do they go? Yeah, that's interesting because when these girls come, my mode of uh, approaching rehabilitation is never to give them the limit of time. Mm -hmm. We never tell them you're going to stay here for one year, two years, or three. We give them that time of staying as long as they are able to stay. That means they should be able to get out of their difficult situation and say, I'm going to move on by myself. They make and the decision. Exactly. And when they move out, we still support them because a good number of them are back employed by us, and a lot of them are working on these purses. So we still have that connection. It's like a, a thread, a needle. I read that some 60,000 uh, girls were abducted and people were displaced. Well, not all of those 60,000 people have a sister Rosemary. <laughs> What's happened with the others, do you think? You know, much as they talk about uh, 60,000, it's even an estimate. There could have been more, but again, we have to know a lot of those who are killed. Mm -hmm. And some who manage to escape, of course, we find that there are some other people who are trying to help them, but it could not be in the greatest way as I am doing. And not only me, luckily enough now, I am totally involved and just become as our call as sacred art sisters. Mm -hmm. So I do believe this could actually go anywhere. The sacred sisters would take up this commitment and continue helping these girls. Mm -hmm. Not only in Uganda, it is also going to continue in South Sudan. So far, you've given us the, this wonderful history of the, the work that you're doing at St. Monica's. But now you've, you've got, I think, a larger vision, and you've opened up another school in Atiak yes. in northern Uganda. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about what's your vision and what's the time frame for this full vision? You know, I used to think a lot or work along the idea of uh, writing strategic plans and <laughs> having business plans, but I thought it was not working anymore with me because I thought I'd remain to dream. Mm -hmm. And my dream is to continue going where that need is. And Atiak was one of those places where there was need. I was just invited to go and see how I can get some of those women and bring to San Monica and Gulu and give them the same education or skills we are giving. And uh, I thought I was getting like 10 or 20 people. When I went, I found like 150 mm -hmm. and they had children and I said, I can't take them all. So I totally made up my mind and said, instead of you coming, I remove you, I will move here. Mm -hmm. We will come here and start exact school, the replicate of that school here. Okay, in 2014, Time Magazine named you one of the 100 most influential uh, people in the world. A year later, you were a CNN hero. It was before. It's given you a lot of personal 
recognition. Has this been helpful to you? Has it made your life more difficult? Has it been a good thing, a bad thing? No, for me, it has been a good thing. One, it made my life better because it has given me a real platform okay. where I can speak to people. And uh, I think it has given me more freedom. Mm -hmm. At least I can meet people and I speak, I can talk on behalf of those who are not able to reach the audience, who are not able to reach that forum I'm speaking in. And of course, I think that is the greatest thing of exposing me mm -hmm. because this situation had gone on for so long. Of course, uh, people knew about it. People were not speaking about it. Maybe there was not a little bit of courage to speak about it. And you can see, I always talk about Northern Uganda. Mm -hmm. That means I am not satisfied about what has taken place in Northern Uganda. I feel we can do more with the women and children. Well, what is your, we, we have only about a minute left. What is your fearless forecast? Something in, in the future that people can wait to see happen? Would it be the, the, the building of your restaurant? Or wh wh what is in the future that you're looking forward to? You know, it's not only that. I am very sure one day in future, some of these young women and children would be actually the greatest leaders. Coming out of this, this Coming out of, of this. Right. Because we are doing everything. We are trying to put them. We are giving education. We are giving them that openness. We are letting them get integrated. But above all, these are people who are going to fight against this evil. Because wow. we are helping them that the past has gone, but there's a future. Do not go back. So we never know who may come out of this. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm so happy that we were able to hear this story. Thank you so much for inviting exactly. me and listening to me. You are wonderful. Yeah. I'm especially glad that you could be with us today. Join us next time for more current conversation. Thank you for watching.